Welcome, everyone, uh, and especially in particular, welcome to those members of London School of Theology uh, who are viewing this presentation via video. Um, the purpose of this short session is to explore the possibilities of engaging in integrative theology with a biblical focus, or maybe to ask the question, what does it look like to do what has sometimes been called integrative theology and, and to do that particular enterprise uh, with an emphasis on how reading the Bible informs that particular process. But perhaps it's important uh, in the first place to just define very quickly um, what integrative theology is and what it stands for. Uh, essentially, integrative theology seeks to reframe theological discourse away from sterile categories, inflexible doctrinal statements, and predetermined outcomes. Instead, what is sought is a way of doing theology that opens conversation, takes new information and situations into account, and integrates a diversity of insights into an overall process of thinking about God, the world, and all of the things that we tend to think theology should be talking about. Uh, one example of this is actually proposed by two authors, Gordon Lewis and Bruce Damaris, and uh, their book is actually called Integrative Theology. They propose five uh, sort of strands or categories of learning and discipline that could come together and, inf and, and inform a more holistic version of theological discussion. So here are the five categories they suggest. Historical inquiry, biblical studies, uh, systematic theological inquiry, uh, doing the work of apologetics, in other words, framing how our theological conversations might be heard by those outside the Christian faith, and then finally asking practical questions about that kind of theological enterprise. How does that actually make a difference or affect the way communities of faith and people respond in light of that information? So what they're trying to do is bring all of these strands together, and they call that integrative theology. Although such a method is unquestionably a step in the right direction, it nevertheless retains categories that are often rigid or imposed, and I want to suggest to you that we can even be a little bit better than, uh, than this particular approach in defining what integrative theology can look like, particularly if we're going to come at it with a biblical focus. Uh, so what does it mean to engage in an integrative theology while maintaining biblical focus? To unpack that question, I might ask it a little bit differently, and here's my way of saying this. How does the Bible itself, as an inspired collection of highly diverse literature from a wide range of experiences and locations, model or commend an integrated approach to all of our thinking and reflection about God, the world, and our place in all of this? <coughs> As a way of stimulating our thinking then this morning, let me suggest three starting points, or three ways in which the Bible itself, as we have inherited it, can inform how we think about and talk about integrative theology. These three areas are story, marketplace, and community. Let me begin by saying that I think an integrated theology must be rooted in the biblical narrative, and that's what I mean by story. I operate with the conviction that biblical focus is an embrace of a certain telling of the story of the world, its people, and its future. More specifically, the point of orientation for telling this story is to wrestle with the idea that the one God, Israel's Yahweh, is both the generation for this story and its main character. We may want to explore that. that that the conviction of the biblical texts are that Yahweh is both the generator of the story and he's also protagonist, he's the main character. Throughout the biblical text, the role of narrative or story in the framing of theological observations and claims is striking. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, the covenantal memory of the psalmist who rehearses story or narrative. Uh, the calls for renewal by the prophets continually hearkening back to the story or the narrative of God's people. The gospel accounts of the life of Jesus set in the framework of narrative or story. And then the early Christian sense of identity and calling 
as people who this wasn't a brand new thing, but they are continuing or moving forward in an ongoing story that has a past, a present, and a future. A uh, recent emphasis on this is a welcome trend both in biblical studies and more generally in theological discourse. For Western readers of the Bible, the first port of call in developing theology is what Christians, I think, call the New Testament. That tends to be where we want to start uh, as Western readers. It's not uncommon for such readings to find use or reference to the Jewish scriptures as either an afterthought or simply as a proof text of something that's really much more important or poignant in the New Testament. And I'm sure you can tell by the way I frame that, that I reject that kind of reading of the New Testament. This impulse fundamentally misses the very perspective of the New Testament writers and communities themselves who understood their story, their identity, to be the story of the one God and his people throughout time and memory. And maybe we could discuss this a little bit further when we get to the end of the presentation. There is an inherent danger here of making extrapolations or inferences about God and the world from these biblical texts when they are detached from this larger story. In other words, I think the dangers, and I've just, I mean, we could probably all come up with ideas. For me, uh, a couple of thoughts I have are that these texts and these ideas about God and the world very quickly become sterile if they're not part of this larger story. They often become hostile. And uh, it's, it's not hard to think of instances, perhaps all of us have had experiences where people have used biblical text or made theological claims detached from the story of God and the world and his people and what all of that entails. And the use of the Bible simply becomes, it, it becomes a bludgeon, it becomes hostile. Or, uh, and this perhaps is something that we often fear in the work that we do here in a Christian university, uh, if, if it's detached from the larger story, what we say about God and the world is just irrelevant to anyone else. It's only an academic enterprise that we're entering into here. So that's the first thing. I think a biblical focus on integrative theology has to start with the story or the narrative. The second thing, though, is that I think integrative theology has to be in conversation with all the disciplines. In other words, the Bible brings us, I think, to the marketplace. The twin postures of curiosity and humility in the learning enterprise require that integrative theology be informed by the insights and queries of the full range or spectrum of human learning. It will not do to confine our theology conversation to the halls of seminaries or departments of religion. A biblical focus in this enterprise reminds us that the wonder of creation, the concerns of economy and politics, the quest for justice and peace, which we find on full display in the biblical texts, demand moving the conversation into the marketplace. Nothing less than interaction with the full range of disciplines and learning experiences should be sought. The sciences, the arts, media presence, emerging technology, all of these things are places, I think, for theological discourse. In what I've just described, I would insist that such an agenda, far from, being, far from moving beyond biblical focus, is actually being true to the biblical theme of God's sovereign interest, involvement, and enlivening activity by His Spirit. What does it mean to be the people in whom God's Spirit continually arouses curiosity that truly values and incorporates the spectrum of learning disciplines? What does that look and sound like? Whatever that becomes, it will be theological conversation that's integrated into the marketplace. And I find that this is precisely what we discover in the biblical text, is that there's this constant engagement and quest for interaction with the real stuff of life in the marketplace. So we begin with story, and we move to the market, and then finally, thirdly, I want to say that I think an a integrated theology with biblical focus is concerned with community. Uh, originally, uh, the word that I was going to use for this was neighborhood, because I wanted to bring it even more closely home from big story to market to neighborhood. 
But as I thought and reflected on it, I thought the biblical term for neighborhood and what we find in each other as friends and fellow travelers is the term community. Uh, so, whether we consider the text of the Hebrew Bible or early Christian writings of the New Testament, we are dealing with material written for real people in real circumstances. The occasional nature of these texts reminds us that biblical exegesis that brings historical and grammatical insight should be at the service of an increasingly well-informed theological conversation. Further, that conversation, and this is so crucial to me, that conversation must matter to real people living real lives in the real world. This, in fact, is, I think, what we find to be true in the biblical texts. For me, as a student of the New Testament, it seems particularly poignant to reflect on the incarnational quality of God's revelation in Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospel accounts remind us that it is this world of dust, sandals, feasts, epilepsy, Roman power, and we could go on, that become the primary place of God's engagement with this world. So I ask the question, what might that say to us in our world of commuter lanes and legalized marijuana, iPhones, and the like? What does it look like to have these conversations to bring this incarnated God, this Jesus, into the world in which we live today. Further, if we read the New Testament, we find figures like Paul the Apostle traveling the Mediterranean world, building and nurturing real imperfect communities with all of the ecstasy and agony that accompanies human relationships. And finally, in the New Testament, we see John on Patmos crafting visions he hoped would arrest the attention of Christians who were mostly well acclimated to their social surroundings and no longer alert to the impulse and claims of the inbreaking kingdom of God. This is what theology really does. This is what integrative theology does. It reminds us of the story. It brings the concerns of the marketplace and it brings it to bear on the real lives that we live in communities all around us. So in conclusion, let me just uh, tell you a quick story. I want to describe for you a recent experiment in a graduate seminar of mine from which we might make some observations. In a course on reading the book of Revelation, both for its theological and its political agenda or framework, I began with a brief summary in this class of the literary and theological features common to most apocalyptic texts. In other words, we talked quite a bit about the genre, and Isaiah was in that class. Uh, then we identified some common rhetorical strategies employed by a variety of these early Jewish and Christian texts. In other words, we made some observations on the worldview that they espouse and their perspective. What we did next, and I wondered whether I was going to regret the use of this much time, but what we did next for two hours was watch the movie Life of Pi. As an exercise, in experiencing the alternative world that storytelling can lead us into. In other words, entering a reality from two very different ways of knowing, what the philosophers would simply call epistemology. And uh, for those of you who have either read the book or seen the movie, you know that you get to the end of this incredible drama that draws you in and invites you to participate and, uh, and vicariously live the experiences of this young Indian boy. And then at the end you discover there are two ways to tell the story. And this is what I was trying to do in this class, is to say that an apocalypse is telling a story that could have facts and figures and names and places, but it's doing it in a much more creative way. Uh, one world is the world of facts and figures. The other was the world of story, color, imagination, and creativity. One version of the story was disappointingly familiar and all too human. The other version of the story was compelling and, though tragic, somehow inviting. It urged much greater sympathy or compassion for the real human drama once it was more than just a series of unavoidable events. So I suggest to you 
that integrative theology with biblical focus can operate in this way. To invite us, not so much into a completely different story or frame of reference, which I think sometimes people who want to hold on to the old systematic ways of thinking about theology are afraid of, you're going to swap the stories on us. That's not what I'm suggesting. But rather to allow us to see shades and versions of that same story in ways that we've not yet explored. And all of this to the glory of God and his ever-increasing kingdom. So that's kind of just some real basic thoughts on uh, what integrative theology could look like with biblical focus. And, uh, and as, as full disclosure, um, I come at this particular enterprise as someone who you know, loves nothing more than just to sit with the biblical text and do nothing but reading text and telling people what I think I see and what I think they should mean. Uh, and yet this seems to me a much more fruitful way of actually doing kingdom work, uh, both in an academic and also in an existential or experiential way. So I'm just going to kind of sit down and field some comments or questions that you guys might have, and then, uh, and then we'll be finished, right? So does anybody want to start, begin with any questions or any clarifications? I have a question. Sure. Uh, I don't know if this is a fair question. Um, you describe a kind of hermeneutic of isolation that, um, especially in the West, we have a tendency to kind of look at the gospel in sort of an kind of isolated yeah. um, arena. And so I was just curious if you have theories about, you know, what were, what were the presuppositions of that particular culture that lend, lend themselves to that kind of behavior, or that kind of approach to scripture? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, I think, uh, to some degree, um, the... Um, both, I, I, if, if I was, I mean, and it's going to sound terribly like we're psychoanalyzing people in the 15th and 16th centuries, but I, but I do think that as part of the emergence of modernity or the modern period, what you have are situations where people are either fed up and angry with the dogma that the church has forced on them, or with the emergence of science, the rise of rationalism, and that type of thing, we're really a bit embarrassed about the fact that you know, what happens in the church or in the parish uh, seems so disconnected or detached from what our scientists and, and uh, you know, our smart people, so to speak, are telling us. And, uh, and I think all of that leads us to try to play the game of theology or to try to join sort of that conversation and we adopted, and I, I use this collective, we adopted the, the ground rules and, and the frame of reference from modernity. And I think that is to some degree what led to an increasing isolation and the creation of theology as um, this conversation that is isolated or detached from everyday life. Yeah. I didn't think about, I mean, one of the ones I've adopted is this like Lectio Divina, and this kind of idea where you just take a single scripture and just kind of read through it meditatively in three different ways. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of an isolation of a particular text. Right. Um, and that's that's much earlier. But I'm just, um, it's, it's, I appreciate what you're saying about how careful we need to be about thinking about salvation, the story of salvation history as this kind of broad and coming of Old Testament and New Testament. Right. And, and what God is doing now. Yeah, yeah. Um, all at once. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, brother. Uh, kind of along the lines, maybe as a follow-up to this a little bit, when, I mean, one of the things that the story tells us is that the reality that we oftentimes face is not the only reality. Right. And that can have an escapist feel to it at times, but that's not, I don't think, the intention of the author is there. Right. Their intention is to say, you, you bear witness to something that is not. And sometimes, or that is not readily apparent right. to, to, to others. And sometimes, obs human observation and the story can come into conflict with one another. Right. So in terms of integrating theology within the real world, do you see what sort of limits or boundaries would you maybe place on the ability to do that? And just Because sometimes I think this is presented as, well, we simply just engage with everything, and, and that's going to lead to more fruitful theology. At times, sure. mm -hmm. we come to loggerheads over things that seem you just at a place where you have to decide mine is the way of 
one of the faith, poor right. wine is the way of the miracle death. Right. And what for you, when you're looking at this and kind of sweeping out this this approach, do you, do you have boundaries? What what's your what's your thoughts on moments in that in that where where there could be problems or there could be some tensions that arise? Yeah. Well, I think what I hear you saying is the possibility of a tension between uh, the second and third observations that I made with the first one. And I think that's one of the reasons why, for me, the order is actually somewhat important um, in the way the presentation was carried out, that we begin with story. And I, and I would say at this point, obviously, as someone who was wrestling with the implications of the biblical text on how we do integrative theology, I limited my conversation to that. But I think your question raises a, a good um, reminder that we are also the heirs of 1900 years of the story of the Christian church and that the ongoing narrative of the people of God reminds us that there will have been times where um, these conversations were taking place and people did, did draw hard and fast lines and, and at times had to then revisit those later on and so my, my suggestion would be I think um, the biblical narrative, the story element that we refer to, is the starting place or sort of the, the place that we can refer back to when in the marketplace or the community we find ourselves in conflict with other ways of telling these stories or other perceptions. Or the views of the human. Yeah, or other views or of the human. Or the views of how community actually does run. Or right. Or how it actually develops. Right. Because the modern world has a view of how community is held together. Yes. And I, I think it's deeply problematic. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm coming from obviously a biblical tradition. Yeah. You know, critiques that. I, right. And that, I guess, was my. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, very helpful. no it's, it's a good comment. And I think a couple of words that I used, uh, if this was going to be a much longer lecture, I would unpack what does it mean to be curious in the world? What does it mean to be humble? So curiosity and humility as we engage the disciplines, um, but doing so moving forward from this larger biblical story, I think, is, is a way to both embrace the possibilities and be prepared to critique you know, those, those moments at which these counter voices uh, hold fundamentally different values. Yeah, Thanks. great, great comment. Anybody else? Any other comments? I guess I have an architectural question. Yeah, you, yeah. you, you, you um, discussed the Lewis and Damaris book, um, discussing yeah. the great theology, which is sort of where you sort of take your cue and then begin to critique with some of what they're doing and provide right. uh, another answer. Um, these, and I'm not, I'm not read the book, but they talk. You say they talk about historical, biblical, systematic, apologetic, and practical right. aspects to an integrated theology. Um, and of course, all of those are scientifically considered their own <coughs> theology as right. well. Um, I guess I'm trying to place exactly, you know, sort of what your project here is, and trying to see or sort of understand a little bit more about what you're doing here. How do you see your vision of integrated theology with biblical focus? interacting with the traditional theological disciplines, historical theology, church history, traditionally conceived biblical theology, systematic, apologetic, and practical theology. Yeah. So what you do, replace that, nuance that, interact with that? How do those, how do those dance together, so to speak? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, it, what it is not is a rejection either of their particular framework or really it's not a rejection of, because in fact their project was not a rejection of historical theology or biblical theology or it wasn't uh, their attempt was to bring these things into conversation and I think my critique is to say I'd like to see even um, a broader definition of what needs to be in conversation here so um, what I propose is not a replacement of that framework but to suggest that that's not the entire spectrum for the conversation um, so it should incorporate the historical, uh, obviously biblical, theological, systematic um, aspects. Um, just trying to draw the boundaries a little bit wider. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Ron, can I follow? And this is yeah. a follow-up. Yeah. I mean, sort of comment, but also mm -hmm. kind of phrases maybe the question as well. Do you think that that type of approach would help to? I don't like seeding ground to things like inflexible doctrinal statements. Right. If those doctrinal statements are saying that when you come, you come into contact with God and God's presence. Right. And even though you don't see it, it is still active. Right. 
Do you think that this method is a way of trying to loosen up some of that rigidity mm -hmm. and and maybe trying to come at thing because this whole notion of somebody becoming sterile, sometimes it's just an accretion where, where these things become abstractions to people and then sterility sets in. Yes. It begins right. to calcify something that it, it was not intended to right. be. And these are ways of, of engaging in a, in a productive and fruitful way with those older, because I, I mean, if I hear Joshua, yeah. Hunter, I would never want, for a variety of reasons, right. to to move past or beyond as though right. we could do that. Right. These these ways or methods of engaging with the biblical narrative. And I, it sounds like, is that kind of what you... I, and again, you yeah, I, I think exactly right. What we're talking about, I think, to some degree, is a recovery, uh, not, not a rejection or a moving beyond, not in some, you know, postmodern, we, this has had its day and we need to go in a different direction, but rather um, this framework is a, I think, it looks for, it hopes for, it works toward a recovery of what has been vital or vibrant, but is prepared to bring on board more conversations. And, um, you know, I, I think a good example of that is, um, especially in the Western, perhaps more specifically to the North American context, how has, for example, uh, the Christian Church in North America wrestled with the uh, the influence of science, um, uh, the conversations about evolution and creation and that kind of thing, and um, we can see historically how the people of God at times or institutionalized forms of the of the people of God have simply rejected those types of insights out of fear, threat, uh, not be, being prepared. So it's not so much. Uh, it's not so much a case of rejecting everything that's gone before, but a recovery of what's authentic and placing it into a story that our stories live into as we move forward. So, that yeah. all sounded very familiar with the Bible of us. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you've had that experience. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. We can continue the conversation, but I think I'm going to stop the video. Um, so Isaiah, if you don't mind just hitting the button, that would be great. Thank you. I mean, I do have a question, Don.